This is a 1996 Buick Roadmaster, and it's different. Different from modern cars, anyway, because this is a wagon, a family wagon with a big V8 under the hood, body on frame construction like a truck, fake wood paneling down the side, and it's as long as a Ford F-150. They literally don't make them like this anymore. And today I'm going to review the Roadmaster and show you all the quirks and features of the last old school American family hauler. Before I get started, big news, this Buick Roadmaster belongs to Hoovy's Garage, and he's auctioning it live on cars and bids. This is a final year 96 Roadmaster with a big V8 in pretty good shape, and Hoovy's offering it with no reserve. So, once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for the Hoovy's Garage Buick Roadmaster, where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the Buick Roadmaster, truly one of the last old school American cars. Big body V8, giant gas guzzling thing. This was really the end of the line and the end of an era, so let's go through it. Starting with the name Roadmaster. Buick used this name on some of its opulent luxury flagship models in the 1930s and 40s. And years later, they revived it for some station wagons that were massive, and so the Roadmaster name still fit. This was the last Buick to use the Roadmaster name. It went out of production in 1996. Probably this is the last time Buick thought they could use this name and actually get away with it, have it be true, because Buicks made since then haven't exactly been Roadmasters. Now, this particular generation of Roadmaster came out in 1991, and it shared its platform with other giant General Motors vehicles. There was the Chevy Caprice, which was offered as a sedan or as a Caprice wagon, just like this car. There was the Chevy Impala SS, the performance version. There was also the Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser, or you could get the Buick Roadmaster. These were available as a sedan, a four-door sedan, believe it or not, or as a station wagon, but it was the wagon that was by far the most famous. Massive, with huge wood paneling down the side. This is the car that has become the icon of this generation of General Motors vehicles. Now, since the Roadmaster went on sale in 91, it always used a big V8 under the hood. Initially, it was a five liter V8 that somehow managed to make only 170 horsepower. But by the end of the run, by 96, and this is a 96 model, they were using the LT1 V8 from the Chevy Corvette, 5.7 liter, and it made 260 horsepower, which still wasn't a massive number, but it was pretty good for the mid-90s. And it was a big V8 for a big car. This measured in at just under 220 inches in length, which makes it about two feet longer than a Volvo XC90. And I'm not talking about the old original XC90 that came out a few years after this car went off the market. I mean a brand new XC90 which by most measures is considered a pretty large family hauler. Well, this was a even larger family hauler 25 years ago. It's huge. And it had a pretty big curb weight to accompany the size, 4,700 pounds. Although given its size, that's not that much. In fact, it's pretty much equal to that modern Volvo XC90, even though it's about two feet longer. Still, 4,700 pounds is a hefty car. Now here's another crazy number. Properly equipped with a towing package, this could pull 7,000 pounds. Had a big V8 and it was body on frame like a truck. So if you wanted to use your family wagon to tow, you could do that. All of these came standard with a four-speed automatic transmission and rear-wheel drive, and they had eight seats split across three rows. Your first two normal rows of seats, and then a rear-facing third row for extra people. So let's talk about that third row, starting with the tailgate opening process, which in this car, by modern standards, is absolutely bizarre. So here goes. You start the process 
process by pressing this silver button located above the license plate. You push this button and then the glass pops open and then you're into the tailgate area. And from there, you have choices. There are two handles on the inside top of the lower tailgate, both with images of the Roadmaster on them. And you can see they're showing two different things. The handle over on the left side shows the tailgate kind of folded down from the back of the car. So you pull that and the tailgate comes down and then you can sit on it, you can hang out, have a picnic, or you can use that to climb inside pretty easily, whatever you want. Your other option is the Roadmaster, the tailgate is swung out. If you pull that, then you open up the tailgate like a door in back. You had two choices for how you wanted to open the tailgate in your Roadmaster. It is a wonder this company went into bankruptcy. Anyway, once you have decided exactly how you want to open the tailgate on your Roadmaster, then you can get into your third row. And you can see back here, it's a big one. Three across seating with seat belts for three passengers in back, letting people sit back here and watch behind the Roadmaster, a novelty of growing up in the 90s that is almost completely gone from cars today. And that might be a good thing because there are some serious drawbacks to this setup. One of which was, once you were back here, you couldn't get out unless someone let you out from the outside. You do have the little tailgate handles in back, but don't forget the tailgate opening process started by popping the glass, which you can't do from the inside. And with the glass down and in place, the whole thing is latched closed. So you're back here, you're just hoping somebody comes and gets you. Of course, sitting in back also meant you don't have access to a window that rolls down, so it probably gets pretty hot. Although you do have this tiny little vent window on the side, but that's it. You could open that up either side of the back of the Roadmaster. That was the only fresh air you got. The third row might seem like a cool place to be. You can look out and wave, but you're probably going to be pretty uncomfortable back there, and you might be trapped. But anyway, next we move up front for all of the many quirks and features in the rest of this interior, starting with the fact that, well, it's blue. It is, in fact, very blue. Everything in this interior is blue, 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 blue. Now, by modern standards, this isn't really all that crazy because colored interiors are making a comeback, but this is the exact type of car that killed them off. Everybody associated blue and red interiors in the 80s and 90s with these big old school General Motors grandma cars, and nobody Nobody wanted them. And for years, people only wanted black, gray, or beige interiors to get away from cars like this. Now that most of these are off the road, the colored interiors are coming back. But it's interesting to see kind of the car that killed them. Now, this interior is especially blue, even by modern standards. There's not all that much other colored stuff to break it up. Even plastic pieces like this seat adjuster, blue, as you can see, and the climate vents, blue. Even the owner's manual pouch is blue, maybe to match the interior maybe for the General Motors colors, but regardless, blue, 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 blue in here. Now, the other thing you will notice in this interior is it is truly old school in here. The seats are these vastly overstuffed, ultra comfortable American car seats from this era that probably had no actual back support or lumbar, but they looked stuffed and they felt comfortable when you sat down. Also, you can see in this front seat area, there is a center console, but you can flip it back and then you have a front bench seat with three across seating just like an old school car should. Also an absolutely hilarious hallmark of old American cars from this era and before is the use of excessively extravagant language throughout the interior to describe fairly typical items. They really wanted to hook you by making things seem more exciting and impressive than they were. For instance, the speaker is described as constant Concert Sound 2. <laughs> Not just concert sound, this was the improved version. The suspension is Grand Touring Suspension, which of course, this is a 4,700 pound vehicle the size of a pickup truck. The only thing I'm certain about is it did not have Grand Touring Suspension. And then there's my personal favorite, the Twilight Sentinel. <laughs> 
which is actually just the timer that controls how long the lights stay on when you park the car and walk into your house at night. But they had to call that the Twilight Sentinel to make it seem more exciting than it was. And by the way, speaking of lights, the headlights in this car are operated in an unusual manner, at least by modern standards. To turn them on, you pull out this circle on the left side of the dashboard, pull it out, and then the lights are on. And you can see this circle also twists. That's your interior dome light dimmer switch. So if you want the cabin lights dimmed, you twisted that light switch. Certainly odd by modern standards, but fairly typical on cars like this. Less typical on any car is the seat controls in here, which are not mounted on the seat, but instead on the door panel, and they're mounted in a circle, up, down, back, forward, and then some tilt controls. Not exactly intuitive, but they are all labeled, and you figure it out relatively quickly. One thing that is intuitive is the power window switches, which are mounted on the door panel and placed corresponding to the windows they control. It seems obvious, but they still labeled them all anyway. Left, right, up, down, just in case somehow you were confused by this, your window switches had labels to make it more obvious. So also another interesting old school touch in this interior, look on the door panel and there's no immediately obvious grab handle you can use to pull the door closed. That's because it's this leather strap that's integrated into the door panel. You pull on that to close the door, almost gives you feelings of like a carriage door from the horse and buggy days, such as it was in the Roadmaster. Also interesting in here, the gauge cluster you can see is absolutely massive font, which probably played pretty well with the old people who typically bought this old school car. You can also see they've specifically called out 55 and 65 on the gauge cluster because those were the highway speed limits for years in America, and a lot of American cars did have those in a special spot. Another interesting item is cup holders in here. They weren't common in American cars in this era, but the Roadmaster has them. You lift up this center console lid and they're in this storage compartment. You fold them out and those are your cup holders. Certainly an afterthought, but they existed. Also in this car, you have a couple little compartments under the dashboard that are hidden. One contains the ashtray and cigarette lighter, as you can see. And above that, you have another compartment that's just storage. A little out of the way, you wouldn't necessarily know exactly where it is. And it's pushed up in the dashboard in order to create extra leg room in case you want to transport a middle seat front passenger. And by the way, speaking of that central area in the dashboard, you have climate control here, and specifically automatic climate control, which is a nice luxury. You set the climate to the temperature that you want, and then the car makes it so in this interior. A pretty nice luxury touch for a 90s American car. But the real fun came in back, because that's where you had the sunroof. Yes, that's right, look up, and there is a glass panel sunroof back here. I believe they called it Ultra View, and it was a novel concept at the time, a glass sunroof for rear passengers. It hadn't really been done all that much, or frankly at all, and so it was kind of a neat feature. Now, it didn't open. You couldn't open it up and enjoy the breeze, but you could, as a rear passenger, look out and up, which you couldn't really do in any other car. Now, of course, by modern standards, this just seems normal with panoramic roofs in basically every car. But back in the day, it definitely wasn't normal, and it was a big deal. And it had a cool special quirk. This little black bar, which you can see on the back end of the sunroof, had individual sunshades. So rear passengers could pull a sunshade closed in case they didn't want the sun coming in and heating them up in the back of the car. It looks like Hoobie's Roadmaster only has one of these sunshades working, but it's there and it's a pretty cool concept with this roof. Now, aside from that, this back seat is actually a little bit disappointing. There's not all that much space back here because they had to make room for the front seats and the third row with its giant cargo area. And so the back seat got smushed a little as a result. But it does have some nice touches back here. For one, again, an overstuffed leather luxury seat, very comfortable, just like up front. You also had little reading lights operated with switches, which was a pretty nice luxury at the time. Usually lights in back just went on when you opened the door, and you had power windows back here, which was another nice touch in back. Now, you didn't have headrests, so if you were in an accident, well, good luck. You also didn't have rear climate vents back here. No rear seat climate controls at all. You were just kind of at the mercy of the people in front. And you didn't even get a rear armrest back here. Nothing folds down. There's no cup holders at all. 
You didn't have anything like that. But you did have ashtrays, two of them in fact. On each rear door there is an ashtray because that superseded everything else back in this car's era. And then there was the exterior, the outside of the Roadmaster, where there are many more interesting quirks. I've already covered the size, which just to refresh is huge. <laughs> But it was more than just that. You had the wood paneling, which isn't actual wood. It's just this fake vinyl laminate thing that sort of looks like wood, but it helped to give the old school illusion that buyers of this car wanted. People who bought these, their dad had a woody station wagon in the 50s, and so they wanted to relive that in the modern era, and this vinyl fake wood helped to give them that feel. So did the cover over the rear wheel. Instead of a full wheel arch, you had this sort of half wheel arch, which made it feel like an old school, maybe 30s, 40s, 50s car, and it gave it that nostalgic air. And since Buick was playing up the nostalgic old school concept, this Roadmaster also came with a hood ornament. As you can see, the Buick logo, and around the edge it says Collector's Edition, which was a ridiculous concept. Nobody was ever going to collect these. And this isn't any different from any other Roadmaster, it's not some special version, but they put it there so that people could have a hood ornament and feel like they got some special vehicle, the Collector's Edition. <laughs> So what happened to the Roadmaster? Why did this car die off? The answer is, well, frankly, the SUV. The last year of the Roadmaster was 1996, which coincided pretty perfectly with the arrival of new, big, full-size GM SUVs. There was a pretty new Suburban at the time. The Chevy Tahoe had just come out. The Ford Expedition was going on sale. This concept never really died. The big old American hauler, it just more into an SUV. People wanted to sit up higher. They wanted even more towing capabilities. They wanted winter capabilities with four-wheel drive and extra ground clearance. And the wagon died off in favor of the massive SUV, which still exists in one form or another to this day. But it is worth pointing out that this really was the end of the line for the old school American hauler. Ford got rid of their big old station wagon after the 1991 model year. The 92 Crown Victoria it was all new and there was no wagon. This lived on all the way to 96 and then that was it. The big old body on frame, rear wheel drive, massive wagon was gone and it will never come back, at least not in this form or anything close. All right, driving the Buick Roadmaster, the old school B body. These things are just ridiculous cars. When I was a kid, people had these and actually used them as family transport, but mostly it was grandparents. It wasn't parents. Parents had, had all kind of graduated to smaller vehicles by like the 90s. They wanted like a tourist wagon if they were gonna get any wagon at all, but usually they were in caravans or Ford Explorers by then. These were for the grandparents. They still had to see the kids. They, they wanted a kid-friendly vehicle, but they didn't want any of that SUV stuff. They wanted an old wagon like their granddad had. And that was this. Now, I think it's basically impossible to deny the fact that this is a tremendously cool car. Whether you think it's cool ironically because it's kind of a stupid car and, and you know, it's like the 90s old school feel, or if you just think it's cool because it's like the last of a dynasty, it's still like neat and interesting in a way that so many 90s cars just weren't and aren't. Um, this car, obviously it has a lot of interior plastic, but I don't consider it like a plastic era car. This sort of feels like you're still like the last gasp of the 1950s or 60s. I, I, I felt that about the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, and I feel that about this car too. You're looking out over a hood ornament, you've got a big V8 under the hood, and everything is about like comfort and space, interior space, as opposed to anything else. Oh. You go over a bump and it just floaty, floaty. It takes a suspension about five bumps to level yourself back uh, into kind of a flat situation. Now, Hoovy loves these cars because they are comfortable. He likes a big, comfortable cruiser car, and that's why he buys something like this. I don't disagree with him that it's comfortable, although I will say it's not quite as comfortable as I think he makes it out to be. You know, driving this car, you still do get a little suspension roughness. And of course, the car is just so structurally loose that like, you're, you're kind of like doing this every time you corner basically anywhere. 
it's a little bit of an unsettled feeling in my mind. With that said, you are sitting on this nice, supple leather, which feels good, and the engine is very smooth. You get this big old V8, which was a performance car engine in the Corvette, but when you stick it in a vehicle that's this big and heavy, it turns into just sort of a smooth V8 with some power. Now, a lot of these B-body cars were driven and used, and then they've had a resurgence in the last few years because they're relatively cheap to buy and relatively reliable, so a lot of people started buying them ironically and, and like modifying them in a cool way like we had an off-roader one on cars and bids at one point or people used them as work vehicles like general motors thought some people might um so it's hard to find a nice one this is a shockingly nice one it's got 86,000 miles on it which isn't low but this is one of the better preserved ones of these roadmaster wagons i've seen now as you can imagine going around corners I mean, there's no, there's no like fun to be had in this car from like a driving experience perspective. You're, you're, it's not fast. It's not quick around corners. It wallows everywhere. You slide around in the seats. If you let yourself, you can just slide in every corner. This car isn't like fun to drive, but it is fun because it's this like cool old school thing. And it actually people I'm, I'm noticing that driving around, people like smile at it. Like, oh, my childhood <laughs> driving down the street. I do think this is a special car, and it's certainly a relic from a bygone era. Technically, this is a 96 model, but this really was the last car that felt like the 70s, the big era of massive Lincolns and Cadillacs and Buicks, and you know, before the gas crisis, before Honda, before plastics really showed up, cars got smaller. This car was, was like that. It feels like those cars did. And it's kind of cool to drive that around and experience that, especially in wagon form. You could bring your whole family if you wanted to and have this kind of like classic weird car experience, but actually in like a fairly practical car as opposed to like a muscle car, which, you know, isn't really a family vehicle in most cases. No, you cannot floor it in this car and get a thrill. You can't go around corners and get all excited, but it's fun in a different way in that it like just recalls a totally different era and it definitely feels like it's from a different time. And so that's the 1996 Buick Roadmaster. These are cool cars. I've always loved them. Not many survived in decent shape, but Hoovies is pretty nice and you can buy it on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give the Hoovies Garage Buick Roadmaster a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 42 out of 100, which places the Roadmaster here against some other big ol' American cars from this time period. These Roadmasters are inefficient and massive, but they're also cool. The end of an era, the last of a bygone world of giant domestic vehicles. Most people buying these cars are now doing it for nostalgia, rather than to actually take advantage of this car's capabilities. And I think nostalgia buyers are only going to continue to flock to these old school wagons in the future. 